I find that one of the barriers with talking about climate is that people get overwhelmed with facts and figures and sometimes that sense of overwhelming information makes the brain, makes my brain wanna say, no, stop, I can't take it in, it's too much, I don't know how to deal with this. And I thought, oh my gosh, if I'm having that reaction, then somebody else is probably having that reaction. And so we wanted to make a play that could get in through a kind of emotional back door and turn facts and figures and overwhelming information into a story that people could connect to. My name is Miranda Rose Hall and I am a playwright. Ever since I was a little girl, I thought I wanted to be a writer. But then I got to college and I met some students who were taking a playwriting class and they would all hang out together and uh, eat snacks and read each other's plays and they were just having fun with one another and it seemed like a much better way to spend your time or my time than writing sad poems alone in my room. But recently I made a play called Plot Points in Our Sexual Development and that premiered last October at Lincoln Center at LCT3 and that was my professional debut. I had a play at Diversionary Theater, which is an LGBTQ theater in San Diego called The Hour of Great Mercy. I went to Georgetown, which is where I met uh, my fellow company members in LubDub. LubDub is a physical theater company and we make stories about myth, magic, and science. And a couple years ago, we read a book called The Great Derangement by Amitav Ghosh, which is a call to action for fiction writers and fiction makers to tell stories about the climate. Not long after that, we read a book called The Sixth Extinction by Elizabeth Colbert, which won the Pulitzer Prize. It's an incredible book and it talks uh, about extinctions of the past and extinctions of the present. And that really lit our fires. And we decided that we would want to commit um, the next cycle of our work to making work about the climate. Uh, before Miranda wrote the play, we all um, went up to Saratoga Springs, New York, um, with the Orchard Project. We were in residency there. And we did uh, quite a fair amount of thinking about climate as a hyper object, um, which is an idea that a philosopher named Timothy Morton um, is wrestling with. Uh, just this idea that climate is like so big, um, the challenge of climate chaos and the problem of climate chaos, um, that you can't quite get your head around it. We were all kind of rolling around on the floor and doing a lot of experimental devising, which is how we generate material. I um, came out of that residency thinking, I think I wanna make a one woman play about extinction. And as a company, we all decided that that is a way we, one of the ways we wanted to move forward with the material. It's about a woman named Naomi, who is not a performer. She is a dramaturg. She is behind the scenes normally. She works in a small theater company with two of her best friends from college. And normally these two friends, Zoe and Sarah, are the ones who perform in a play that they've all made together called Climate Beasties. Which is, as Bill, the kind of in your face, no holds barred, spectacular meditation on the catastrophe of climate change. And they've had to go home for a family emergency and they've said, Naomi, you have to do the play on your own. And Naomi says, oh my God, I can't do that. And she walks on stage with some research that she's done about extinction to create something out of nothing. There's this part of the show, a whole scene with like, which is of conservation and there's a cauldron and a, a bat puppet and after the show at the post show talk back which I I always facilitate <laughs> this woman raises her hand and is like have you heard of this book the sixth extinction by Elizabeth Colbert she has this whole chapter about these bats and I say uh, I started it but I got busy and she says well that's not surprising it's a difficult book <laughs> yeah I know <laughs> So of course, I vow to read it that night in one sitting. So I go home and I get the book and I start reading it again. And has anyone in the audience tried to read The Sixth Extinction? Wow. Oh, um, has anyone finished it? Wow, all right, good for you. Um, so I started rereading it, and I, I <laughs> a woman devoting her life, or so she thinks, to climate change, starts rereading this book <laughs> about climate crisis and mass extinction and the apocalypse of the golden toad and the death of the coral and the collapse of the rainforest. And at first I was like, yep, 
Yep, yep, yep, uh-huh. And I mean, it was unnerving. The information is unnerving. <laughs> but it didn't rock my world. Like, I mean, I learned some things. It's a very well-researched book. It won the Pulitzer Prize. I was learning some things about science history that seemed useful. The book seemed useful. And then I get to this chapter about these bats, these little brown bats, and about how they're dying from this horrible disease. And I was, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> I was sitting there reading it, and I couldn't breathe. And I, going to get personal here, I started weeping my face off, projectile sobbing. I wept and wept and wept, and I was like, what is happening? Because for the record, I don't even like bats. <laughs> and actually, I hate them. Especially when they get into my house, and like my mother and I have spent many a summer evening trying to kill those rabies babies with our tennis rackets. And then I read this chapter about these little brown bats dying from this awful disease. And for days, days, I was walking around consumed with these bats. And even thinking about them made me weep. Bats! Something about the little brown bats lodges itself in her soul and she can't shake it. The story of extinction often comes down to isolation. Just a couple members of a species are left. I was really intrigued by the isolation of the one woman show. I think that that became a very powerful mode for me. It felt like it wasn't the play to have 20 people on the stage. We realized that we had these lists of species in the play but that there wasn't a sense of what they looked like and that that felt like a real absence in the play. And we decided, well, we'll just print all the photos of these uh, more than human creatures, animals, plants, and we'll have our actors show um, them to the audience. And for me, because I was involved in the printing of these photos, it was the first time I was really struck by the volume. I was like, oh my God. Endangered species. Italian dune grasshopper. Rodriguez flying fox. Pig nose turtle. Enchanting paphiopetalum. Three spotted dwarf minnow. Little brown bat. Critically endangered. Pygmy raccoon. Elongated tortoise, plowshare tortoise, Haven rhinoceros, variegated spider monkey, marbled gecko, Nassau grouper, Vancouver Island marmot, extinct in the wild, Socorro dove, Wyoming toad, Pierre David's deer, Hawaiian crow, St. Helena redwood, she cabbage tree, golden skiffia, Butterfly split fin, Kalimantan mango, yellow fatu, Christmas island blue tailed shining skink. Extinct. The subject of extinction or the subject of climate crisis does not live in the halls of science alone. Everybody has a relation to the environment and everybody can do something to change the way that we interact with the earth. Definitely a core challenge in building this piece is how do we take these overarching narratives of global crisis and chaos and make them um, really local and really personal um, and highly specific so that people can connect to them. Here is Dr. Carbon Fever and Mrs. Connie Sumption in a new unscripted conversation. Could you pass me a little more wine, Connie? I can't. <laughs> Why not? I can't tear myself away from the window. What are you looking at? I'm not quite sure what I'm looking at, doctor. 
cars and trash and forests on fire and... Oh, dear, not this again. I, I wish that you could join me for just a moment. <clears throat> Connie, I wish that you would come back to dinner. No, I can't eat dinner. I'm too consumed with death. What kind of death consumes you? Mass death, mass extinction, death by famine, drowning, dehydration, decapitation, boiling alive, strangulation, starvation, suffocation, poisoning, heat stroke, hyperthermia, hopelessness. <clears throat> Doesn't it consume you, doctor? Well, Connie, I suppose I assume that we're all going to die. And death is natural, after all. But to die like this is completely unnatural. What is so unnatural? The rate, the scale, the level of terror, the total collapse of biodiversity? How can it be unnatural when nature itself can be cruel? Isn't human cruelty natural? No, it can't be. Are you so upset because you're surprised? I have no illusions about our capacities. I've never been so foolish. Maybe for a moment when I was very young, but we've done what we've done. Might as well move on. We only have, what, a few years left at this rate. Why not eat our dinner, drink our wine, enjoy our lives? I thought you of all people would understand. <laughs> Talk to Naomi. Who's Naomi? <laughs> the one who prints out all the scripts and buys all the books. <laughs> oh, she doesn't know. She doesn't know anything. She's just standing there in front of all those people and she doesn't know a thing. Well, it's not my fault she didn't follow the script. Goodbye. <laughs> My greatest hope is that this, this show can help people break down the emotional blocks of grief and rage and confusion and that hopefully the work of the theater can help people feel connected to one another and connected to this material in a way that doesn't make it seem so impossible to engage or so overwhelming to engage and that people will have a will feel like they have a personal relationship to some of these species and that they're not living in an isolated little bubble and that people can feel that we are all connected and that the health of the earth and the health of all species on earth is an interconnected story.